Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Alex Witcher and I am the event producer here at the BIA. Welcome to our webinar this morning on adaptive manufacturing. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube from next week, so please feel free to send the link to your colleagues. We'll be taking questions, um, so please use the questions box if you would like to ask a question at any point throughout the webinar. Um, we can address questions after each presentation if, if you have questions um, that are relevant to that presentation. Um, and we'll also do questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to Professor Alan Dixon, who will introduce the webinar and our speakers. Oh, good, good morning, everyone. It's uh, Alan Dixon here from University of Manchester. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Adaptive manufacturing is an aspect that, if I just get my first slide up here, there we go. Uh, a, 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 an aspect that's of great value and great interest currently within the whole manufacturing sector. If we uh, look here at the first slide, we'll see I've tried to identify the pipeline that is, I suppose, generic to all sorts of biopharmaceutical products and information. So we go from a, an expression platform that has very specialised modes of producing the right product and the right status, taking it through to harvest of the appropriate material, and then onwards to the, the delivery that has to go through a formulation and the effectively putting things into manufacturing uh, containers that can then go to a patient. And all the way through this process, we're, we're looking at the quality of the material, making sure it retains the right potency and that it's stable and it's safe. And this sort of delivery format may be different for different purposes. And th these are really complex operations that are often operating across different factory sites, at different times, and materials moving backwards and forwards and have to be continuously reviewed and checked. So we end up with a, a complex series of operations that has led to um, the production of many top selling pharmaceuticals. Um, the, the antibodies and related proteins are uh, making up many of the top 10 in terms of sales of the biopharmaceuticals. And so clearly th this is an operation that works, but the question is whether we can make it better and whether many of the challenges associated with making high quality materials suitable for use in, in human therapeutics can be eased. And can we remove some of the, the challenges in, in moving materials back and forward between different sites? And I think in terms of the next slide, we see a, a changing landscape. We're, we're going to be moving away from the types of products, which is biopharmaceuticals are very much protein based and for which we have a, a long history into the areas of advanced therapy, medicinal products. And in particular within those, the cell based therapeutics are going to radically change the processing by which manufacture to the appropriate scale is carried out. And with this challenge, it's not entirely clear how we will make a material that might be used very locally, near a bedside perhaps, has a very short half-life and which might not fit into the traditional type of manufacturing processes. So really in adaptive manufacturing, we're looking at the way in which process steps may be integrated and may be controlled in a way that ensures a, a rapid and perhaps a controlled system that is more efficient, more predictable, at least a product that's more clearly manufactured in a way that reassures us of the quality. And there's great significance here for the cell-based therapeutics, which are going to have to be generated in a very rapid manner that won't allow us to move back and forward between different sites. Associated with this, we're, we're looking at the way in which adaptive manufacturing might incorporate automation. Automation that enables a process control to ensure the quality in the real time online, a set of analytics that will ensure that we're getting molecules of the appropriate status or getting cells of the appropriate status to move into the patient level. 
So there are real challenges here. We're moving into areas that will involve new technologies, will incorporate information that's come from automation in processes in other industries. And the question is whether we can carry this out in relation to the type of products that make up the biopharmaceuticals industry. What I've tried to do is just give you a very brief introduction to set the scene, but I'll, I'll now hand over to a, a real series of experts in this area. Uh, we have Andy Topping, who is Chief Scientific Officer at Fujifilm Dyson, who will speak first. And then Damien Marshall, who's the Head of Analytical Services at the Cell and Gene Therapy Centre in London. So Andy, I, I'm going to pass over to you now. Are you, are you online and are you available? I'm passing over control of the slides to you. I am, yeah. Thanks, Alan. If I press the button, it should move. Okay, perfect. It works perfectly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm just going to spend a few minutes really um, um, talking about um, some of the promise that adaptive manufacturing really, um, uh, really offered and maybe why it hasn't quite delivered uh, for some of the traditional biopharmaceuticals and um, the protein products largely that um, Alan was talking about. Um, and then a little bit about um, why we need to do a little better um, as we move into some new um, therapy types, especially cell-based therapies. And then um, I think Damien is going to give us a few real-life examples. Um, so just uh, by way of a quick introduction, um, I'm Chief Scientific Officer for Fujifilm Diasynth Biotechnologies. Um, um, Fujifilm are that uh, uh, Japanese company that make the little green boxes that, um, for those who are old enough, remember I had uh, 35 millimeter photographic film in, um, but it's also a very diverse company now. It has a big um, healthcare business, and part of that is uh, contract development and manufacturing um, to support our pharmaceutical production. Uh, we have three sites uh, across the world, uh, one in the northeast of England, and one in North Carolina, and one down in Texas. Um, we're dealing with um, um, production of biopharmaceuticals, uh, which is really proteins from microbial and mammalian systems and viruses for use as gene therapy vectors um, from, uh, from animal cells. Um, we run at a reasonable scale of manufacture um, um, from microbial up to 5,000 litres and we have multiple 2,000 litres for, uh, for cell culture. Um, and um, I mean, we've been doing this quite a while. Um, the two, the, the what is now Fujifilm Dyson was originally two competitor CMOs, which were combined. Um, so between the two sites in the northeast of England and North Carolina, we have uh, each site has 25 plus years experience. So we've made lots of products, hundreds of products, thousands of batches. Um, so, uh, um, so hopefully a reasonable base um, um, for, for what I'm about to say about um, uh, adaptive manufacturing. So uh, back in 2003, um, the FDA um, produced some guidelines on uh, what's called PAT, Process Analytical Technologies. Um, and that's really the basis for adaptive manufacturing. And it's quite a nice, simple concept. Um, Let's make real-time process adjustments based on product measurements to ensure that we can uh, manufacture material of, of suitable quality uh, because the processes we're, uh, we're running have an inherent variability about them because of the materials we're using, whether that's the cells or whether that's the raw materials that come in for the cells to grow on. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of uh, potential variability. So let's just measure what we're making and make adjustments on the fly to ensure that um, the, correct, uh, the, uh, the material we make will be safe and consistent. Um, and it also builds, of course, greater process understanding, allows the potential for real-time release of products so we don't have to wait, gather everything up at the end and then test it all to check that it's okay. We can, we can almost test as we go. So it has a lot of advantages. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of attraction to it and and it's really it really has lots of parallels in in other industries as well um including the uh, small molecule pharmaceutical industry which um but when we look at all those um hundreds of products that we've made thousands of batches um most of those products are still manufactured based on this uh, paradigm that the process is the product um so that we can't fully define 
um, and test what we're doing. Um, so we have to run a very tightly defined fixed recipe to ensure that we always get the same output. Um, and this involves a huge amount of, uh, of laboratory work as you get towards a commercial process where you're going to make many, many batches um, to establish what those which variables matter and what the acceptable ranges for those are. Um, and traditionally, that's been done using just uh, one factor at a time, univariate kind of uh, process control strategies. So we must operate between pH 7 and 8. And if we operate between pH 7 and 8, we have the data to support the fact that the product will be as we expected. Uh, and over time, those have become rather more complex. Um, so that we will have multi multivariate control strategies. So um, if after seven days of the process, the cell number is above X, then the pH should be between 7.5 and 8.5. So there's, um, there, there's a um, design space for all those, for those process steps. Or if we've maintained the process within that design space, we know what the product will look like at the end. Um, but really, that's what we're doing. We're making process adjustments, not based on any knowledge of what's happening to the actual product we want to make. We're just making process adjustments to stay within that design space. Um, so it's not really it's not really PAT at all. It's it's just we're running a more elaborate version of a fixed recipe. So it's, so it sounded great. I mean, the adaptive manufacturing, the ability to change things on the fly, sounds sounds really good. So why, why aren't we doing it? Why, why isn't that the routine way of manufacturing things? And I think there are, there are quite a few reasons, um, one of which um, is nothing to do with science and is all to do with how these products are developed, which I've just tried to illustrate on this slide. So as a project, um, as, a, as a product um, goes from an idea through to an approved product that you can fill a prescription of, and yeah, there are a number of clinical phases. Um, and many products go in at the beginning as ideas that are going to be tested in the clinic um, and, and you know, tested as a, a safety study for phase one and efficacy study for phase two and then a, a, you know, a proper full on placebo controlled um, uh, clinical trial for phase three to show that it really does have the um, efficacy versus the current standard of care and, and then approval. Um, so two things about this. One is one is that many more things go in at the left hand end than come out at the right hand end, um, and the other is that it takes a long time. Um, so processes which are being approved now um, were developed the best part of ten years ago. Um, so there's there's a big lag in the system. So lots of the processes which have been run over the past several years were developed a lot more years before that. Um, so they aren't always particularly cutting edge, if you like, in terms of what's possible to do with them and how they're controlled. Um, the other is, um, which is actually more of a problem, is that most products fail. So most products that get pushed in at the left-hand end of this triangle don't come out at the right-hand end. Um, and because um, PAT, adaptive manufacturing, has most of its benefit around ensuring consistent manufacturing when you're making batch after batch after batch, um, it's much more difficult to justify applying it when you're only making one batch or you're making two batches or three batches um, because the, the, the need to move very quickly and to fail fast, if you like, is, um, is more, that's more of a driver than it is to ensure that you have completely consistent manufacturing for when, you're, when it's an approved product. So I think some of the reason um, we are, well, it isn't really done that much in the traditional protein manufacturing is, is because um, the, the approval process, the system is almost rigged against wanting to build it in early. And of course, if it's not built in early, it becomes very difficult to um, change processes significantly as you get towards the sort of tip of this. The other, another reason why um, why we aren't doing it maybe as much as um, as as we thought we might um, a decade or so ago um, is because the molecules we're making are complicated. Um, there's, there's an antibody on the left hand side. Um, you know these are 150,000 um, molecular weight products. Um, very very complicated. Lots of possibilities of um, of changes to them. Um, residues are Yamidated residues are oxidized, residues mispair, they, um, um, they aggregate. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the couple of chromatograms here, these are just size exclusion chromatograms for a couple of antibodies. 
we have the aggregate diluting first and the main peak, um, and then some uh, smaller forms after the main peak um, diluted. Um, you can see there's there's variation. It's very difficult to um, it's very difficult to apply a single method that works for all, all the products. The changes you're looking at are quite subtle. Um, so e even if we uh, accept that the aggregates at the front end of the peak are clearly separated from the main peak. Um, the shoulder on the back end of the uh, uh, of the main peak clearly isn't so well resolved, and the um, uh, the uh, peak at seven minutes on the left hand end doesn't appear on the right hand one. So there's quite a lot of uh, variation. It's quite subtle uh, because these are complicated molecules. And just to add to the degree of difficulty, we're of course trying to find you know a few percent of um, of, a, of a variant amongst you know ninety eight percent of the main peak. So, um, which is of course very similar. So it's actually pretty challenging to um, to do on the fly measurements of these real attributes that we're interested in. And if you want to try and do it, um, the equipment that we need to use to do it is pretty complicated, delicate equipment. Um, so that's a UPLC on the left and a capillary apparatus system on the right. So these typical analytical equipment we would use for, for looking at the variants of the proteins that we make. Um, but manufacturing environments are pretty busy and they involve moving large, heavy equipment around. Um, and these are pretty complicated, delicate pieces of equipment which don't really appreciate having a nudge from a forklift truck every now and then or, um, um, or having something dumped on them in terms of uh, liquid uh, that might uh, leak out at some point from a, from a, 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 from a tank. Um, so they can be difficult to, uh, to operate in a, um, in a manufacturing environment. Um, the other thing which has sort of um, um, made this a little harder than, again, than it was anticipated, this is what manufacturing facilities um, used to look like. Uh, and actually, lots of manufacturing facilities, of course, still look like this. Um, so this is um, stainless steel tanks. And these are a couple of bioreactors here and hard pipes together. Um, through various control panels and, uh, and, and, and uh, sensors and detectors and pumps and all, all sorts of uh, equipment you would expect to run these sort of process steps. Um, and you could at least anticipate how you could hardwire some fancy technology in terms of uh, analysis and feedback to the, uh, to the process into a system like this because it, it's fixed. Um, you've got big steel tanks, you've got pipes, they're not going anywhere, you can add new pipes, you can, you can you know, add, new, add new plumbing to the system if you, if you want. Um, unfortunately, over the last 10 years, manufacturing facilities have changed quite a bit. So now they typically look like they much more like this, using this sort of equipment. So on the left, this is what a bioreactor now typically looks like, up to at least a 2,000 litre scale, and there are some larger uh, versions available. And so although it looks like a, uh, a steel vessel, it, it, that's just really a holder. So it's just a jacketed holder um, for the bag that goes in it. So the, the plastic bag you can see sort of sitting out the top is actually the, uh, the container for the cells. Um, and on the right, the, similarly on the downstream for chromatography, rather than using stainless steel rigs and, uh, uh, and steel columns and things like that, um, it's now plastic. So plastic columns packed in plastic and the flow path for that, the chromatography speed is all throw away. And so it's intended to be single use. So um, trying to plumb in, if you like, those um, rather complicated analytical equipment um, into a system which you want to dismantle all the time and throw away, preferably, um, you know, ups the degree of difficulty considerably. And the need for cheap sensors which you can throw away that only cost a few dollars um, really limits your potential to, be able to use a um, way of fancy analytical techniques. Um, so we can do some stuff, of course. Um, you know, we need basic process data um, from the single use systems to allow us to run the process. Um, so, um, so although we're not measuring the product um, itself in, in any shape or form, really, and we do have various measurements and various sensors available to us, information we can easily gather um, from processes which are using single use systems. Um, so those are things like um, dissolved oxygen, uh, pH, 
of UV through the downstream. Um, substrates and metabolites. So this is an area that uh, I think Damien is going to talk about, and there has been a lot of activity in recent years. So looking at um, microscopy of various sorts, whether it's um, infrared or ramen, and biomass sensors. And so there is information we can get. These are all things which you can which you can get sensors which are which are either non-invasive or are, are cheap enough that you can just throw them away. So that I think the trick now that, um, um, that, that, that we're trying to that we're trying to play um, is to find a way of, of taking some better guesses. Um, so we want to take that information from uh, from those basic sensors and, and maybe add in some other information. Um, Fujifilm, of course, are uh, in the green is in the photographic film um, and big uh, capability in um, imaging. Um, they're actually looking at the cells. Um, are they clumping together? What does the surface look like? Um, it provides quite a bit of information about what's going on within the cell. And if you feed that into a system, which also takes on board um, basic um, information around the conditions of the culture from those single use sensors a second ago, and you feed it into some kind of machine learning model, and then it um, and then it crunches the data and it will give you, uh, you can infer the quality attributes. So we're not measuring aggregation of the actual product we're trying to take, um, but, um, but the, the machine can learn which conditions or what the cell looks like under different conditions that will promote aggregation or minimize aggregation. And I think this is the most likely way forward, at least for the moment, for, um, uh, for protein production. Um, we probably aren't going to get very cheap sensors which can directly measure the, uh, the product and we fit there with the single use systems um, but we're trying to make much better use of the data that comes out of them and building in simple and non-invasive things like um, imaging of the cells themselves and to add more attributes that we can use to, um, to build a picture of what's going on. The challenge with these of course is uh, making sure we can validate it. So we need to be confident and be able to demonstrate that um, if you feed the same data in, the system will make the same decisions. Um, and that uh, can be something of a challenge. So it's not all bad news, um, we do, which is good because um, we actually need um, adaptive manufacturing more than ever. Um, the, the big push in the industry, of course, to try to move from batch processes towards continuous processes and, and continuous processes, which are much more efficient for a manufacturing industry, has much more potential for processes drifting. And so it's much more difficult to ensure the quality of product that doesn't change during a process. So um, there's a, there is a need to begin to um, do more in terms of measuring either directly or by in, inferred measurement and what's going on in the process. And, and as Damien's just about to describe, I think um, the new product types um, that are coming along really make the paradigm that the process is the product not, not really workable anymore. And, you know, when you're starting material for a personalized product um, is something as complicated as a cell and it comes from different individuals. Um, it's very difficult to go you know, to the um, of a process which is basically saying I do the same thing over and over again, regardless of the fact that that must happen different. And so being able to adjust the processes on the fly for these um, um, new products uh, is, is almost uh, a prerequisite. And with that, I'll hand things over to Damien. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andy. So uh, my name is Damien Marshall. I'm the Director of New Technologies at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. For those of you who are not familiar with the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, we're an organisation that was set up in 2012 by Innovate UK to help accelerate and support growth within the cell and gene therapy industry. And we do that um, from our uh, research and development laboratories, which are based down in central London, where we undertake collaborative research with a whole range of organisations within the cell and gene therapy field, as well as looking at regulatory support, clinical support and health economics analysis for these products. And also more recently from our manufacturing center, which is based up in Stevenage, which was opened earlier this year to provide GMP manufacturing space uh, within the UK. 
And this has now got four of the leading cell and gene therapy companies moved in there and are preparing to actually start to manufacture products from this facility. And because of the work that we've been doing within the cell and gene therapy space, we've been in a really privileged position to see some of the challenges that companies are facing when they're trying to make these complex products. So to give you an example of that, so to give you an example of that, this is the this is the typical series of unit operations that would be performed to produce a cell-based immunotherapy product. So some of the more some of the recently uh, products that have been have received market authorization from the FDA and the EMA, such as Kimria and Yes Carter, are produced using using a similar process to what's described here. So you would have a cell sample that would be taken from a patient. These would then be sent to a manufacturing facility. The, cell, the cells of interest, the T cells in this case, would be selected out from that cell sample. These cells would then be activated using monoclonal antibodies to, to trigger the cells to enter proliferation. The cells would then undergo a transduction, typically using a, a virus or a retrovirus or a lentivirus to transfer a transgene into the cells. Once that's done, these cells would then be expanded. And at the end of that expansion process, the cells would then be formulated and cryopreserved, ready for QC release and, ship, and shipment back to the patient. Now, even though the, these series of steps look relatively straightforward, they actually present a whole range of challenges when it comes to product manufacture. Not least of this is the fact that we've got a whole range of variables going into the process. And this is variability in terms of the raw material, so the growth factors uh, or the cell or the media supplements that are used during the production, but also the cells that are going into this process. These are typically cells that are taken from patients that, have that are different ages, patients that may have undergone different frontline treatments, uh, and patients where their disease progression may be at different, slightly different stages. So there's all this variability that's going into a process. And then once, that's got, once it goes into manufacture, we're then using a constrained process or so a very stepwise approach to manufacture. And unsurprisingly, at the end of that, we can end up with variable product quality. And in a worst case scenario, you could end up with a product that's, that's designed as, a, as a, a treatment for a very sick, a very sick patient that could end up failing, failing release specification. So just to show you an example of this, this is these are cells, uh, these are leukapheresis cells that were taken from four healthy donors. And you can see even when we're using healthy material, we get quite a lot of variability after cell selection in terms of cell number and also the phenotypic makeup of the cells. So the CD4 to CD8 ratios within the T cells there. So even from this healthy material, we're already starting to see a lot of variability. And this could obviously be exacerbated when you're looking at using patient material. Unsurprisingly, if you then take this material and put it into a production process, you can start to see variability occurring. And this is just the viable cell densities over, over 13 days um, for, the, for these four healthy donors. And what you can see is that we've got subtle changes in the, in the timings when the cells enter proliferation, differences in the proliferation rate, and also differences in the proliferative potential of these cells. And so that makes controlling this manufacturing quite difficult. So, we need, we need to have better ways of actually taking information and making manufacturing decisions in order to allow us to produce more consistent products. To give you an example of, of, of what I mean by that, if you take this, this um, data and you wanted to look at the point when you're going to add a virus, and, and in this case, you would want your cells to have entered proliferation when you add your virus to the cells in order to deliver the transgene, then under a really rigid process, it may be a decision that on day five, that's the point that when you would add, add the virus to the cells. But you're looking to add your virus to the cells in a controlled ratio because you want to control the number of integrations that the virus will have within the genome. And so if you were looking to add the virus to cells in a ratio of, of approximately one in this case, what you can see is that if we add the virus at, at day five after 120 hours, we'd actually end up with a ratio of virus to cells ranging from 0.9 to 3.2. And this can obviously have a knock-on effect in terms of the quality of the product at the end, but could also have some could also have some safety implications in terms of the numbers of viruses that are integrating within the genome. So an alternative to that might be to say, well, let's measure let's measure cell density, and then we'll make a decision about when to add the virus based on that. So let's take a more adaptive approach towards this manufacturing. But just taking cell samples and measuring cell and measuring viable cell density could also be challenging because in this instance here, just using healthy donor material 
we could have to, we could end up having to take cell measurements for about 18 hours, which in a GMP environment presents a number of challenges. And if you're thinking about how you would then scale this so you could produce hundreds or even thousands of batches of these products a year, it's going to be it's going to be a pretty significant challenge to take manual samples and, and, and take this kind of approach. So if we want to really look at how we can use adaptive manufacturing, even for making relatively simple processing decisions, such as when we're going to add uh, a supplement or a virus or whatever that would be to to uh, to our culture, then we need better technologies in order to in order to do that. And this is where opportunities for looking at process analytical technologies really come in. And, and as Andy mentioned, there's a whole there's a whole series of these technologies that are now being applied in the biopharmaceutical area and we need to understand how these can now be used to support cell and gene therapy manufacture and of particular importance i think are the the process analytical technologies that let you do real-time product monitoring because this will allow us to get greater control over the production process and potentially manage some of these sources of, of, of variability if we can start to look at how we can incorporate process analytical technologies into our manufacturing uh, processes then we can also start to consider how we could use this data to actually start to think about automated process control. So rather than having to do manual interventions, actually taking process data and using that data to trigger a reaction within a manufacturing process. And that could be as simple as triggering when tr monitoring glucose to trigger when a, a, media, a media feed is initiated within the, within the process. And ultimately, in the future, you can think about how you could use all of this information to use to, to start to go down avenues such as computer integrated manufacture, which is where you're gathering data from your entire process stream and then using that to look at how you can implement things such as parametric release or even uh, release by exception so that you don't have the burden of the QC testing at the end of your process. You actually know that when you get to the end of your manufacturing process, as long as you've not had any deviations recorded within that process, that your product is of sufficient quality to actually release and actually go to be treated and actually used to treat a patient. Now, as I said, PAT is getting a lot of traction within the biopharmaceutical industry. And because of that, we're now starting to see a lot of technologies being developed to actually make measurements within 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 a manufacturing uh, bioreactor, and there's a whole range of technologies that have come out. There's the spectroscopic techniques such as uh, near infrared spectroscopy and Raman that will let you do measurements of uh, glucose, glutamine, and various other media supplements. There's a whole range of fluorescent sensors for measuring uh, pH and dissolved oxygen. We're seeing we're seeing holographic imaging techniques that can actually image the cells and give you measurements of of cell shape, cell density, etc. And then there's also a, a whole range of technologies for measuring biomass and cell viability based on impedance and stability. And all of these technologies can be used in line to give you real-time analysis. But we're also seeing a whole range of outline, outline analytics as well. We're seeing, we're seeing mass spectrometry techniques coming out for measuring media components. We're seeing HPLC techniques and UPLC, as, and, as Andy mentioned, for measuring various, various components of the media. And we're also seeing other, other rapid uh, rapid measurements for measuring cell viability and biomass and, and various other uh, metabolites within, within the culture process. But the challenge that we've got within the cell and gene therapy field is that these technologies are not really developed with cell and gene therapy manufacturing in mind. These are really developed for, bio, for bioprocessing of biopharmaceuticals. So most of them, particularly the inline measurements, are sensors designed to go within stir tank bioreactors. Now, unfortunately, there's, there are not a lot of cell cell based products are manufactured using stir tank bioreactors, and instead they're actually producing using a whole range of different production platforms. And because of that, this can actually limit the opportunities for applying these these different types of sensors to make inline measurements. So, in this example here, you can see that within the stir tank bioreactor, you've got, you've got a lot of options in terms of the inline, online, and outline measurements that you can make. But if you're using, for example, a rocking motion or lateral motion bioreactor, then even within the inline measurements, the, the opportunities and the technologies that are available become much more limited. And indeed, within these rocking motion bioreactors, you're pretty, limit, you're pretty much limited to measuring pH, dissolved oxygen. And in some of the technologies, you can also incorporate uh, a biomass probe using, uh, you, by measuring to measure capacitance. If you're in planar culture, which a lot of the technologies are in planar culture, then you, your options can become even more limited. And in some cases, you might be limited to just doing outline analysis. Now, even though this is put, this is being put forward as a, as a limitation, even outline analysis, even outline analysis could provide really important information 
for making manufacturing decisions, particularly if it can provide that information rapidly to allow you to make quick processing decisions in a proactive manner. Now, because of this potential, for the last few years, we've been looking at a whole range of technologies to see how these can be incorporated to support, in particular, cell therapy, cell therapy production. And one of the technologies we've been really interested in is Raman spectroscopy. So for those of you that are not familiar with, with this, this is an optical based biosensor. The Raman sensor goes into the bioreactor and actually sits, the actual sensor head actually sits within the culture media. So similar to how a pH or a dissolved oxygen probe would sit within a bioreactor environment. Then what happens is you fire a laser into the culture media and a few of the photons of, of, of that laser light will interact with molecules and will undergo what's known as a Raman shift. So the wavelength of that, the wavelength of that light will shift. And the way that, that the way that that the wavelength of that light shifts is actually directly in relation to the molecule that it's interacted with. And so, for example, if you know what the Raman spectra for glucose looks like, you can go into that spectral data, you can pull out the Raman spectra for glucose, and you can actually use it for tracking glucose consumption within your process. Likewise, if you know what the Raman spectra for lactic acid looks like, again, you can then identify that within the Raman information and track lactic acid production. So you can you can potentially track these, uh, these metabolites and sugars in real time. And this can be also then be applied to cell and gene therapy manufacturing. So this is an example of a Raman spectra from a single time point that we, that we got within a cell therapy, immunotherapy manufacturing process. And the nice thing is that we can actually then take this data and use it to track a whole range of different sugars and metabolites. So in this example here, if we just look at the example in the top left-hand corner for glucose, the, the solid bars there are showing the Raman data for the four for the four healthy donors. And you can see there, this is showing the glucose consumption over, over 12 days. The, the, the circles there are the offline measurements that we've made for glucose that we can use for, for calibration. And you can see that we get a really strong correlation between the Raman measurements that we're making in real time and the offline and the offline measurements for, these particular, for, the, for, for glucose here. And so we can have a high degree of confidence that we can use systems like Raman to track glucose consumption within our systems. And you could use this information for, for example, triggering when you would do a, med a media addition in order to maintain a healthy environment within your, within your uh, culture vessel. And we can use this simultaneously for measuring a whole range of parameters. So in this example here, you can see that we can measure glucose, glucose consumption, lactate production, glutamine, glutamine, glutamine consumption and glutamate, cons and, glutamine and ammonia uh, production. So we can track a whole range of metabolites in real time using these types of systems. So they've got a lot of versatility and a lot of potential opportunities. Another technique that we've been particularly interested in as an outline technology is metabolomics. And we're re being really interested in metabolomics because the metabolome is the end product of cellular processes. So what you're actually seeing is a functional fingerprint of your cell quality and your cell behavior. And the system that we've been, that we've been implementing to do that line analysis here is in, in the catapult is based on, on mass spectrometry analysis. And the nice thing about these atline technologies is that they're becoming really rapid. So with this particular technology here, we can take a media sample from our, from our culture process. We can put it onto this system. It will automatically extract the metabolites. It will automatically do the mass spec, mass spec run. And then it will do data, automated data analysis for around 100 metabolites. And it will do this in 27 minutes which means that in a, very quick space, in a very quick space of time, we can generate an awful lot of information and, and, and extract an awful lot of data to show how our cells are behaving within our culture system. And we can use that for proactive decision-making. And you can use that information actually in a whole range of different ways. So again, if we're looking at our, our four healthy donors here that we put into a, into a manufacturing process, we could go through and we could identify a whole range of metabolites, some of which will correlate with when our cells are going to come out of uh, going to enter a proliferative state, other markers that are upregulated when the cells are actively proliferating, and markers that are upregulated when the cells are coming out of proliferation and entering entering a non-proliferative state. And we could use, just using these simple few markers, we can actually then track what's happening within our system and make a decision about when we would terminate a particular manufacturing run, because we know that our cells are no longer going to be proliferating. We can also use this data holistically, so we could look at how what the metabolomic profile of our cells is like before they go into proliferation, and what the and what the metabolic profile of the cells are as they're actively proliferating. And then we can get an understanding of what the cells actually require 
during this proliferative state and we can use this information to to decide how we can supplement our media better or how we can make changes to the to the cultural environment to drive desirable characteristics such as more higher higher proliferation rates or prolonged proliferation rates to actually produce higher numbers of, of cells in these therapies we can also use metabolomics as a discovery tool as well and so we've recently we've recently been doing work to look at how we can identify biomarkers using LCMS and these in this example here on the left hand side you can see in left hand graphs here you can see LCMS markers that that increase during 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 the production process or some that decrease during the production process and once we have these we can then actually look at how we can tra transfer these over to real-time monitoring systems so techniques such as metabolomics provide tools that can be used in a whole range of different ways from simple biomarker monitoring all the way through to discovery and holistic uh, holistic analysis but how are we seeing these techniques being used? So if we look back at well, from, from previous slides when we were talking about how these manufacturing processes are run now, where we have a lot of variability coming into our process and constrained processing leading to variable product quality, then what we see in the future is that we'll get, we can use these kind of techniques such as metabolomics and some of the inline technologies to get better control over the materials coming in, a better understanding of how the variability in our raw material, in our raw materials and in particular the cells going to impact our manufacturing processes so we can actually start to think about how we make our processes more adaptable so that we can actually drive a more predictable product quality now i've put on here that this is future because we're not we're not ready to instigate instigate these yet but we are getting tantalizing glimpses that this is that this is going to be really possible in the not too distant future so to give you an example of that again this is looking at those four healthy donor materials that were put into, into, a, into a production run. And what we can see is that we can actually, using the Raman technology, we can actually track marker, we can actually track a marker that corresponds to the viable cell density within that bioreactor. And if we change, if we look at the gradient of those of those Raman spectra, so we can actually just transfer it from a, from a spectra to a, a gradient analysis, then what we can see is if we look at that point where the cells are entering proliferation and maybe the point where we want to uh, make a decision about when we're going to add a virus in order to in order to optimize the use of our virus and, and the quality of our product then we can actually track that in real time using the Raman system and so we're now seeing that these technologies have got they've got some real application for making processing decisions and the challenge that we've got now is actually going through and make and showing that by doing the, using these technologies and making data driven decisions within our process we can actually improve the quality of the products coming out the other end just to end on, I think it's also important to, to realize that as we're going more towards process analytical technologies and all of these data rich uh, approaches, we've got to start to think about how we're going to handle, um, handle and process all of this data. And this is this can be a real challenge. So from if you're using a Raman spectroscopy approach to monitor uh, a production run, then typically you're going to get between three and five million data points coming off of that Raman system. So you've got to start to think about how you're going to handle those large data sets, how you're going to process them. If you've got multiple, uh, if you're monitoring multiple batches, are you going to need to start to think about how you're going to go to some cloud computing systems so that you can share data amongst all interested parties. Thinking about how you're going to look at multivariate data analysis because using these, using these, any of these technologies in isolation is more limiting than if you can actually apply apply them in a multivariate way. We've got to think about how you can have rapid anal analytics um, in order to allow you to make rapid decision making. Because if you've got five million data points from a Raman from from your Raman spectra, you're not using all five million data points. You need ways of pulling out the spectral data that you're particularly interested in and presenting that in a, in a way that allows you to make decisions during your manufacturing process. If you're manufacturing at multiple sites, you need to think about how you're going to handle data that's coming from all of these different sites. And I think also important, we've also got to start to think about how we're going to mine this data, how we're going to use it now and in future. People talk a lot about opportunities for artificial intelligence and looking at digital twins and machine learning, but this is only going to come when we've got sufficient data that we can mine and really and really use for making these kinds of futuristic, futuristic uh, approaches. And so we've got to start to think now how we're going to store and handle this data so that in the future when, we've, when the data sets are large enough, we can actually use this in a really, really productive way. That's it. And uh, I think we're going to now pass over to, to take any questions.
Great, thank you very much, um, all of you, for a comprehensive explainer. Um, so I have a couple of questions. So I have one. Um, how long before we see PAT applied to support adaptive manufacture of cell and gene therapies? That sounds like you, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, we've, we have a project currently in the gene therapy space, which is looking at applying process analytical technologies to support viral manufacture that is due to go into a GMP um, uh, exemplar production run in about 12 months time. Um, so we're hoping within the next year we'll have the first proof of proof of application within a GMP environment for viral manufacture. That will then will then need to address the, the issues of how that will then be validated within a GMP environment and how we will get uh, a data set sufficient that that can then be taken to to regulators to in order to allow it to be applied to support GMP manufacture. So I think it's going to be a few years, but I think we're getting tantalizing evidence that, that, that the concept of adaptive manufacture can really be applied for gene therapy for gene therapy production. And I think that's going to drive ultimately technology development and, a, and an acceleration within this field. I think for cell therapies, it's maybe a little bit further off because the manufacturing processes are potentially more complex. Um, I think the technology is maybe not as applicable. So I think there's a, a, a big piece with, with interactions with technology developers so that we can look at how we can change technologies to, to allow them to be used within all the different types of manufacturing platforms we have within, within the cell and gene, within particularly the cell therapy space, I guess. Um, and I think there's also probably a standardization piece on that as well, because even if even if we could adapt these technologies to allow them to be applied within different platform technologies, then we need to have the standardization in things like access ports so that different probe technologies can be plugged in and out of all of these different different systems. So I think for cell therapies, we're probably we're probably a few years off of a, a GMP proof of application. I think for gene therapies it's much quicker, but I think I'm I'm confident that in the next few years we're going to start to see some 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 uptake of uh, adaptive manufacturing, some companies willing to, to, to really go out there and, and, and employ it. Right. So I have, um, I have a, another question. So several of these advanced analytical technologies have a significant cost. Is this a barrier to implementation or will the benefits of rapid and relevant analytics justify the costs? Wow, that's a, that's a tough question. Andy, Andy, I think it's yours. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you're, you're right. Um, I mean, all of these things have some costs associated with them. Um, I don't think if it's, a, if it's a capital cost, if you like, if it's a one-off cost of we need an instrument, then I think that's, you, you know, that's perfectly durable. Uh, many of the pieces of equipment we use are very expensive to buy, um, but they can be used for many, many things. I think the challenge with some of these is the, um, is at the sensor end, if you like. So, you know, that, those need to be cheap. Um, you know, the technologies that we're using now for, uh, for most manufacturing around single use um, relies on sensors which cost a few dollars um, and can be thrown away. Um, so I think at that end of the wire, I think there, there is, there, there will be resistance if, you know, if the sensors are very expensive and you're throwing away $10,000 sensors for every batch. Um, but if they're ten dollars attached to a million dollar machine, I think that's doable. Okay, I have another question I think related to the previous one. Uh, in your opinion, do you think GMP design of a GCTP facility is something that needs to be adapted or it can follow the traditional baseline design for life science facilities? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think if I, if I, understand, if I understand this right, I'll, uh, I'll attempt an answer to this. Um, so the, the approach that we've taken in the manufacturing centre that we've built in Stevenage is that we have production suites that are essentially, um, that are essentially an open room that, are, that can be configured to support um, different types of manufacturing processes. So, we, we we had to we had the challenge there that we had to develop a manufacturing environment that could be used for for viral production, which are probably going to be using stir tank reactors and probably looking up to kind of thousand liters, maybe even beyond 
type of type of production, but also a space that could could also be configured to do cell therapy manufacture, where you're probably working in tens or hundreds of mills, but having many more batches coming out from from that facility. So I think flexibility in terms of manufacturing is is, is probably not an insurmountable challenge. I think I think getting these technologies into the manufacturing process is the first challenge and then i think getting the tech the getting the sensor technologies that can be calibrated and validated within a gmp manufacturing is, is, is probably a, a a a more a more pressing challenge at, at this time so, so can, I, I, can i can i alex can i add a little bit there just sort of generally I, i'm wondering where, where the new technologies for pat are coming from because you know, at one time, Raman was a very academic area and uh, adapting these innovative analytical technologies to manufacture is, is something that uh, it involves a real interaction and engagement between probably in technical innovators in academia and industrial end users. And I was just wondering, how is that happening and, and how are my industrial colleagues finding that ability to 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 source new technologies? Yes, that's, that's a really good question. And, and for, the, for Raman, I mean, Raman's been around, Raman's been around for about 30 years. Um, and it's only really been in the last, I guess, five or six years that we've seen them be seriously for monitoring within, within bioprocessing. And I think that was more from the pull from the biopharmaceutical industry to make it to make the market so that technology developers are actually willing to look and say, well, how, right, how do we get this technology from where it is now on a laser table with lasers firing through optics and specialist, specialist biophysics, um, biophysicists to actually use it to make it something that can be something more plug and play. And I think it needs the market there to, 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 to engage the technology developers to come and actually look at, at bringing these technologies and making them applicable. But if, if, if the pull is there, and the technologies, even if they're relatively academic at the, at the minute, are there, then then industrialising those technologies, I think, is something that will be will be taken up. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Till, Tim Gilpin from GSK. Do you think people currently working in the biopharm, cell, and gene therapy industry have the skills to handle large quantities of data in real time? <laughs> Um, well, I, 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 well, maybe maybe I'll comment, and then I'm sure Damien has a comment as well. I would say almost certainly not. I think the amount of data that we can generate from everything from genome sequencing through the metabolomics that Damien was talking about, through to um, sensors um, from online sen uh, sensors generating vast amounts of data, I think it's um, uh, I think it's overwhelming to deal with at the moment, and to and to and to count patterns. And People just find ways of simply handling it, storing it, doing things with it. Um, I think uh, um, I think we're we're a little behind other industries which have dealt with large amounts of data for much longer than we have. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think I mean the approach that we're taking is that we're trying to tap into expertise in big data handling and processing, uh, particularly within the UK. So. Um, there are there is another catapult called the digital catapult, which um, which works in, in areas such as artificial intelligence, but in, in in a wide range of industrial settings. And so we're looking at how we can leverage expertise there to support the way that we're handling and processing data. Um, we're also looking at how at how some of these big data challenges are handled in other sectors. So Andy's just mentioned about the biopharmaceutical sector, and we are starting to see some companies look at what infrastructure is needed for big data processing so i saw a presentation recently from uh, from amgen which was talking about one of their future um, facilities that they're building and they're they're talking about measuring over 500 million data points from a single production run and they're looking at the infrastructure and the and the the computer systems that are needed to actually do that so i think i agree with andy i think as a as an industry probably no we're not we're not there yet but you know i i think we're starting to see we're starting to see some people um, become pioneers in this area, and I think there are learnings that we can get from the industries in order to support us in doing this. 
Great. Okay. Well, um, does anyone else have any more questions? Oh, I have one more. Um, what do you think is the biggest manufacturing challenge for smaller companies that want to start GMP manufacturing? I mean, I, I, can, I, can, I can answer that for myself. I hope it was made. Uh, some, of the, some of the challenges for small companies that are looking at uh, GMP manufacture is, um, is closing and automating the processes. A lot of, a lot of a lot of products and processes that are in early stage clinical trials, um, a lot of them may have open uh, manipulation steps, and that can be a that can be a limiter when you're looking at GMP manufacture. So the ability to close and automate might allow you to move from a, a, a grade B environment to a grade C environment. It might allow you to increase your throughput within a, manu a GMP manufacturing space. Uh, and I think those are the those, those are the more the, the, the challenges for small companies looking at, at going into GMP manufacture put probably for the first time. Okay, well, I think that, that wraps us up quite well um, with time-wise. Um, so if anyone thinks of any questions later, please do email them through and I'd be happy to forward them on to the speakers. Um, just a couple of words from us. We are the BIA, the Trade Association for Innovative Life Sciences in the UK. So if you're not a member and are interested in joining, please do get in contact or go to our website for more information. Uh, a few events that are coming up in the near future. Let's try and change the slides here. Um, we have um, our UK Bioprocess Conference, which is in Edinburgh on the 20th November, obviously very topical to this webinar. Um, so hopefully we'll see a lot of you there. We have then, um, we then kick off 2019 with our gala dinner on the 24th of January. Um, where tables are selling out fast, so get in there quickly if you want a table or an individual ticket. Uh, please go to our website www.bioindustry.org and look out, look at uh, the website and around. Um, we've got lots of new facilities up there. As I said before, this webinar will go up on the BIA YouTube channel from next week, and we'll email you with the link early next week. So feel free to forward the link on to any colleagues. Um, so I'd like to say thank you very much to our speakers. Um, and everyone who joined the webinar. Um, and is there any final words from the speakers uh, that they want to say? Or Alan, do you want to say um, a few words or are we here finished? I, I mean, I, I just say thank you to uh, Andy and Damien for giving such a, a lovely overview of uh, interesting areas. And uh, I hope that those people who, who asked questions uh, um, got some answers that helps them think about things for the future. But thank you all. Great, right. thank you very much and have a good afternoon.